Hello there everyone and welcome back to what will probably be the final episode of us playing in this campaign as United Kingdom. I'm your host, Mr. UK Lover, but the fraying black, sure. And while they were necessary to maintain stability, we can no longer continue to extensively fund these clubs. Britain is evolving and internal security is now best served by expanding the funding, resourcing, and responsibilities of a professional police force. Angus Maud turned off the radio and cut this broadcasted voice giving Rob Butler a smirk. But a good work, Angus, said Butler. Offer him a gl glass of brandy. Ma gladly took what was offered. Let's see how the clubs do when they got no money to mend their black shirts. One less problem, thanks to you. One more step towards a better country. I took another sip. Have you thought about what comes next? <clears throat> My friends, yes, I have. There's quite a few irregularities. You'll also be interested in knowing that there's some discrepancies in his campaign funding. Butler's eyes lit up. Oh dear, well, I trusted that the Inland Revenue would get this matter serious investigation. Ma smiled. The two drank and chatted long into the night. Butler woke up the next morning surprisingly absent out of a hangover, energized by another pillar removed from his enemies. He went outside to enjoy the sun and pick up the morning paper. Unfortunately, below his usual paper was a rag he never recalled subscribing to, Spearhead. On his front page was a crude cartoon of Butler, gawping with an ill-fitting policeman's helmet over half his head and on strings held by a hook-nosed stereotype, running fabric cutters over a black shirt. Blood spouted from the fabric below in bold print, Butler cut in the heart of England. He tossed the paper into the nearest bin. Fresh blood. While its ruralist policies are the backbone of support from the rural aristocracy, who for now have a vastly disproportionate amount of influence via the House of Lords. If we're to establish pragmatist supremacy over them, we need an agricultural policy of our own to bring these provincial elements to our side. Luckily for us, we have the perfect man, one who's all too happy to take up the task of using his connections within the party's lower ranks, and so will serve to assemble a team of agriculturalists to draft our own counter proposals. Harold Wilson, the upstart that he is, will be delighted to take leadership of the Department of Agriculture, so we may tear the lords from Wallop by the roots. However, we must be wary of tethering ourselves too closely to this snake charmer. He's a wily character who almost certainly has ambitions above his situation in life. We would do well to try to carefully around him unless we get bitten by the snake itself. Inheritance. Bishop Peter Bishop frowned, adjusting his glasses as he poured over the ridiculous numbers his boss had just given to him to review again. He wasn't sure whether Mr. Jenkins was fudging something or really that poor at keeping track of things. Peter couldn't truly find it in himself to be annoyed though. However, considering the old grocer had given him a job and for a discharged revenue officer with a bad leg whose only other choice would have been a factory or a mine that meant the world. Suddenly, though, he heard the sound of a key turning into a lock, followed by a familiar voice. Peter, love, I'm home. Called his wife from the entrance. God, it was already late. Um, if Joan was home, that meant David ought to be home as soon as well. Jenkins and his numbers could wait then. Rising and wincing slightly at the weight of it putting on his leg, he loved towards the entrance, greeted by the smiling side of Joan, setting a bag of groceries upon the table as well some ought for some odd reason, an open letter. What do you got there, love? He said, placing a kiss upon her cheek and giving a curious glance at the letter. Thought we were a bit too much of shadows for letters these days. Joan shook her head. Continued to unload groceries as she did. Not for us, silly. For David, you know he's going to sit. He's still sitting on the service. Peter grimaced. The boy's a darn fool if he is then. Joan, how many times did he say it? Peter, she interjected. A darn fool. What does he think he had some German dude ready to call him Aaron and wave him in? I love the boy, Joan, but... Peter, they took him, said his wife, primarily... Primely, before turning his back to the bags for a moment, Peter Bishop simply stood there, unsure what to feel. Envy, regret, and relief for men he had served with, with men where the Germans are simply taken or never to be seen again. And yet that night he felt nothing but pride as he uh, hugged his son and told him that he loved him. Honeyed words. The buzzing of the Admiralty's old beat-up TV set was a common sound in the pub. Normally, this would be background noise at best, overshadowed by dock workers bantering about their wives, and their favorite teams were stupid hail soldiers already goose-stepping around Portsmouth. What was strange about today, Amber, was that the men were actually paying attention. Oh, hey, Frank, turn the darn thing up. I could barely hear a word of what he's saying. Uh, why, one of the younger dock workers, only to be met by a scoff from one of the other men? So what? It's always the same crap anyways. The other man adopted a mockingly serious expression. The gracious trust placed in His Majesty's government, and the BPP has allowed us to triumph over traitors seeking to shackle Britain once more. He recited an imitation of Nile Kane's draw, and the same time he did, his man said, and turned the TV dial off. Or turned the TV dial and yet some of the blame must be shouldered by His Majesty's government. Had we responded differently to the many trials faced by the British people, the traitors might never have had their lives, lives taken to root at all. To them, my government shall oversee an expansion of the civil service, a national health service, and the formation of a new trade agreement sanctioned by a course by our brothers in the back, and said Rab Butler. This expression is somber. Our nation's people have heard enough talk, so I'll make the message of my government a simple one. Never again shall our people know hunger, war, or strife. Sounds good, popped up to the youngest dock worker again, hopefully sure, if he delivers, said a third man, unless he bloody talks about doing something for us, so all Don Belover did was yam around about unity. A fourth man silently gripping, slipping his beard alone said nothing. Butler's words did, oh, sound so good. Traitor that he was, he didn't sneer like Don Belover, bark commands like the Germans that had killed his friends, he didn't take look any bit like those monsters. When the deserter listened to the man on the TV, though, his words were drowned out by a single sound echoing in his ears. There were panzers following him as he fled. What we do in the shadows? 
and my five lollies in, in ruins following Knight's betrayal. Most of its senior agents having defected alongside him and the whole organization continues to utterly be riddled with Himmler's sleeper agents. There's one man left who can and already done so during the uprising take up the reins of our shattered intelligence service of one certain Kim Philby. Unfortunately for us, Philby's an Arctic fascist and knows German is a known German file. When not, not, not the man we like leading in British intelligence, he's the only one we've got and possess a clear loyalty to our government and a few spies evidently do. The Prime Minister shall find the time for weekly meetings with Director Philby and authorize the first act of this reborn MI5, an investigation of the Earl Portsmouth. Good. Shoulders tapped, experts assembled. The office door creaked as Harold Wilson stepped into the Prime Minister's office. Butler looked up to greet him. Ah, oh, Wilson. I'm just the man I need. Please take a seat. I'd like to brief you on a new role I think you'd be fit for. Fit for. Wilson briefly raised an eyebrow, then he smirked, then after a short explanation of his assignment as Minister of Agriculture. The Prime Minister paused for a response. A civil servant thought for a moment to think through his reply. He chuckled lightly. Well, agriculture was never my speciality, but I'm prepared to get my hands dirty. I've already got a few names in mind to act as advisors this time next week. Prepare to have a rural policy report on your desk to read through. We can draft a set of policies that will set wallops base of support, while at the same time building up a provincial constituency loyal to us. Butler sat in relief. A grin stretching across his face. That's reassuring to hear. We cannot rule Britain from Whitehall alone. We'll need both countryside and cities under our firm control. The uprising has shown that the trade unions have been a safe haven for radical saboteurs. Assuming you have a plan to exercise this infestation. The newly assigned minister tensed up at the unexpected question before thinking of a response. Yes, yes, no need to worry. I got it all out of control. A white paper is being drafted that shall pass by the workers once and for all. Wilson then quickly rose from his seat. Well, then I best be going now, Butler. Those policy papers don't write themselves. They're from Hampshire to dispel all doubts and familiar bones. All great men of politics have their protégés. Caesar and Augustus, Andrew Jackson and Van Buren, and so on. Rob Butler is no different. In his case, oh, George Wallace won, thank God. Uh, Butler's greatest ally is esteemed MP Reginald Maudley, who gave his, given his closest to the Butler, has earned a key cabinet position. Maudley is a controversial man, however, a friend to all, no doubt, but that includes even those of a less than savory reputation. While many take issue with the man's eagerness to rub shoulders with the elite of Germany's mega corporations, these connections will end up serving as well in soliciting the aid of powerful people, both at home and abroad, and laying the ground for work for future economic development and curtailing the Lord's power. Or Thorn Letter. Before it had all fallen apart, Butler had stolen the office of the Prime Minister from him, Andrew Fontaine, had frequently fantasized about what we had done to the insufferable little worm that was Richard Austin Butler once he came to power. The mental images varied. Black shirts kicking Butler to a pulp. Butler thrown out of Westminster. So venomous were his thoughts that when Butler's only action up against him uh, upon becoming PM was a letter from the Revenue Department, he'd laugh at the weakness. It was only once he'd opened the letter that he paled and called his wife downstairs and summoned his lawyer. Dear Mr. Fontaine, he heard the m mousy lawyer reading softly to himself. It is our profound regret to inform you that our, your estate has been found in violation of a number of stipulations around BBP private donations. The man let out an irritating little cough. Furthermore, we found little found estate revenues. Fountain slammed his fist under the table, causing his lawyer to flinch. Did not, no one ever teach you to read in bloody silence? His wife put a hand on his shoulder. Andrew, Mr. Montgomery, be honest with us. What would happen if we contested this letter? Lawyer fidgeted slightly, uncomfortable with Fountain's gaze. With Mr. Fountain as an active MP, he would most likely pass to the Supreme Court. Speaking frankly, Mr. Fountain, I think they would rule against you. I'm sorry. Andrew said his wife gently, perhaps it's time. You didn't have in politics, surely. No, he hadn't. He refused. He wanted to throw something to scream. To say they'd refuse to yield like this. Instead, the next day, Andrew Fontaine did not know any of those things. He entered the Commons requesting permission to speak and formally announced his withdrawal from parliamentary life. In the dispatch box across from him, Rab Butler wore a cheeky grim. For such a cruel and heartless bunch, they certainly crumble quickly. Trade carefully. It could be scarcely be worse, reflected Rab Butler as he flipped through Philby's first security report to him directly. The uprising had left MI5 badly hurt by the mass desertions. That much had already known. Even still, Philby's report had somehow managed to paint an even worse picture of an agency left nearly empty. Shaking his head, he closed the fold before looking up with an expression of disbelief. Th th I thank you for putting this together on such no short notice, Philby. Is this truly all the agents we have remaining? Philby nodded grimly. The United States folks get ran deep. On Prime Minister Nell Kane's orders, I verified the loyalty of those who remained, but there wasn't many to check. It took a long time to replace his rats with loyal men. Loyal, yes, not bother, but loyal to what? Philby had been a fearsome opponent of Himmler during the uprising, but his family ties... To uh, fascist lords gave Butler pause. Still, he would need the man for dealing with them. Nervous as the thoughts made him. At a brief awkward silence, Butler cleared his sword. I expect you. I, Mr. Wilson, will be of like mind on that then. And my file will be far from the only service in need of restructuring, national health, welfare, education. As this havoc has proven anything, that is, our civil service needs to be one. We have, more importantly, the public can have confidence in. Of course, sir, replied Philby, raising an eyebrow curiously. I've heard that Mr. Wilson advocates for an end to Aryan civil service, removing the same policy from MI5, would make replacing your losses easier. It certainly didn't stop traders to last him around. But other side inwardly in relief. Perhaps the man wasn't a fascist after all. Nodding and turning back to the report, he missed the shadow of an expression that fitted it across 
uh, are flitted across Philby's face for a mere instant before vanishing. One of contempt relates with the smallest hint of pity. Private and public. The first and foremost tendril of Lord Portsmouth and city's influence we must cut is a one plunge into the very heart of our government. Our own cabinet, the Chancellor of the Duchy of Lancaster, the Duke of uh, Buckling, as a long time friend and ally of Wallops. It would have been purged along with the rest of his vile ilk, but the Duke's closer friendship with the King had rendered him all but invulnerable to us until now, though. Angus Maud, devilish genius that he is, has come up with a marvelous plan to uh, get to rid us of this corrosive infection and render Wallop blind to our activities. Simply put, we're going to subject this detestable uh, Duke to the old trick in the book, oldest trick, a good old fashioned stitch up. By implicating him in a completely manufactured embezzlement scandal, he shall be forced to resign or be crushed under the weight of the accusations and rumors. Uh, by the time he's cleared his name, a new man shall sit in the seat, and he will not be getting it back anytime soon. Transcript from Intelligence Correspondence, 4 o'clock, January 30th, 1965. Uh, peer peerage Pension Fraud Investigation. Butler, back to the matter we discussed earlier. Then. The obstructionism of the Lords remains a problem, and their shameless corruption will be a blight. To the dead, I suggest we kill two birds with one stone. Philly, understood. If I may, sir, my office has in the past uh, carried out financial investigations regarding the peerage. Other requests of the Prime Minister... Domville, as it happens, certain irregularities were discovered. We were requested to provide the files to the Prime Minister alone, but with him dead, we are only two men who know them. Butler. Promising in that case, I want your agents to pursue this line of investigation. Focus on peerage pensions after my time in the Exchequer. I'll be more than willing to wager that a number of tax return claims by the Lords are fraudulent. Focus there, and you'll find our dagger against them. Philby. Very well, sir. Butler. We need to tread carefully here, Philby. Very carefully indeed. I trust all this information will be obtained discreetly. Philby. Yes, sir. I'll prove it harder than it would have been before the uprising. Given the number of my agents with connections in the revenue service or traders are dead, so we should be able to avoid involving the home office. Butler, good. Discuss this with no one but your most trusted subordinates. I want our cards kept close to their chest until we're ready to strike. And a page three with a sip of white tea. A step further. Reckless and foolish, thought Rob Butler to himself, pacing behind his paper strewn desk. Reckless and foolish both. Still, no matter how he turned over and said, he found no other solution. The true danger posed by Walt was not the man himself, but his array of friends and the Lords, whom he could call upon to block anything Butler tried to pass. If he wanted to set any chance of stopping these fascist lunatics from stopping his plans, he needed to get one of their more powerful friends on his side. His musings were interrupted by a knock at the door. Butler opened it, hoping that he looked less worried than he felt. Ah, oh, Philby, please come in. Apologies for the mess. I seem to be somewhat buried in these papers these days. Philby peered over his soldier at the said desk. Well, sir, it looks like much better than my desk at Lecon Field House. Sir, and natural papers have been a nightmare and can can add disorganization to the dude's list of sins. He gestured to the chair across at Butler's. May I? Please, Butler replied, though never mind that for now. I had a different sensitive matter I wanted to discuss. Philby quirked an eyebrow at that, but nodded. If His Majesty's government is to have the trust of his people, it must be one that can be seen to act. Paralysis led us to the uprising in. You want me to acquire leverage against their old Portsmouth, sir, Philby? As I was twinkling at Butler's expression, I would be very bad at my job if I hadn't guessed that, but rest assured, sir, I serve at the Prime Minister's discretion. Butler smiled, then genuinely smiled. The rest of the conversation passed nearly in a blur with how light and relieved he felt. This time, when he finally rose to show Philby the door, he shook the man's hand before glancing out of the street below. Perhaps he should go for a walk. The day seems so lovely, very, very lovely all of a sudden. Strings pull at Lord's dancing, but first, time for you and me. Once Britain was a workshop of the world. Then it was a very economic capital of the world, and with economic bank and economic prosperity. The Sierra perished in the fires of the Second World War, raising raised ash by the Lufafa, and the destruction wrought by sea lion. In the 20 years since the end of the war, we have been unable to truly move past this ruin, and that is to say nothing of the further havoc wrought by the uprising. Yet, let us take a step back. With Butler, we have a new government and a new start. An opportunity to remove, remold Britain into a kinder, fair nation. The road will be long and painful, but in time, a greater Britain will supplant the old one. I say it's doable, granted. It'll take a few visits from me and some twisted ears here and there, but with the right friends with us, the peers won't have much of a choice, modeling grinned. Take another bite of duck, followed by a sip of brandy and a satisfied uh, sigh. You really should try that similar rap. The Prime Minister ought to at least enjoy a pleasant meal after the hard work he put into saving Britain. Butler was silent. He thought of the Downing Street of Flame. Animals like Jordan and Fontaine stalking their way through the halls of power. Britain's boys have been butchered in a bloodbath Butler had spent his life trying to prevent. I was a cold comfort to know that it wasn't all for nothing, given the price. If only, Reggie, all I've done so far is slap a bandage on the wound. There will be plenty more hard work to come, all of which will come to nothing if we have to fear a veto at every step. He can never sit down his teacup and look squarely at the Foreign Secretary. Are you completely sure that those friends will fall through? The you have a man nodded, sipping in this drink? They'll follow through. They'll know what's good for the country is good for them. And they're clever enough to know that that's what we are. I'll talk to them, remind them of that, and they'll have to whisper in a few, in my, a few ears. After a moment of dabbing at his lip with a napkin, Maudlin continued. My people have plenty of strings to pull, even with, with the Lords. Just give them a little time, they'll have the Lords dancing to our tune and lining up to bite back the bill. He seems confident enough. Then again, confidence has never been an issue for Maudlin. Though Butler has had his reservations about who these friends undoubtedly were, and what promises he might request, it was true that their aid would prove invaluable, making the Parliament act a reality. 
Schedule meetings and ready to see what can be done. Some comments include um, democracy time and thank God spare one. Someone says, well, that sucked. Uh, everything Britain fought for in the Civil War down the drain thanks to politics and politicians and backroom deals. So. Someone uh, said, uh, would have been far more interesting to do uh, the Triumph Path so we could see the content for this Britain, Britain, this Britain's path rather than do, uh, doing it all. I might as well have played the Resistance, which unfortunately they have no content at the time of this recording. So it says, now that the government has won, do you guys think there'll be another uprising like Maxwell thought of? For this person says, pretty much impossible. Yeah. So it says, an unexpected return of democracy under the rule of Rab Butler? And it'll be a highly flawed democracy. Fascism is so rampant in collaboration with Britain. Even the best collab path is still a downgrade from the worst resistance path. Yeah. We'll see. We shall see. But prosecution. A nation cannot survive treason from within, so spoke Cicero. I think we can all stand in the truth of those words after night almost destroyed everything we've tried to achieve in saving this country from fascist madmen, said Butler. Sipping a glass of whiskey as Maude Manningham Butler uh, poured glasses of their own. Where's the wisdom, Richard? But we've got security affairs well in hand. What's gotten you pouring over the cl classics? Asked Manningham Butler, watching Butler attentively as he reclined into his armchair. A Duke of Buckleck. He has to go, Butler replied, glancing over to check if Ma was still on board with what he was about to propose. The steel had determined looking in his old friend's eyes was confirmed his full support. Sensing something was off, Manningham Butler set down his glass without drinking from any look Butler, Butler in the eye. That's not like an objection, objectionable stance. The man's practically a listening device for a wall of wild dramatics. Butler paused for a moment, biting his lip before at uh, last revealing, I'm, I'm going to frame him for embezzlement. He'll be cleared in the end, of course, with it just being slandered, but he'll be out of the picture long enough for us to pass our reforms to save this country. I know you're a man of the law, but say no more, and he and his friends showed no respect for the law when they ripped up the Parliament Act. That's no reason why the law should respect him, interjected Manningham Butler, gr drawing sighs from a relief from uh, Butler and Maud. The Duke of Buckleck was in for a nasty surprise indeed. The only court that mattered in politics is public opinion. For decisions... Which I don't like. Increases inflation and for 100 revisions. I like this one more. We're truly to rebuild Britain in anything remotely resembling a functional state. We must start from the ground up. Local government, the foundation of our state, has been thrown into disrepair under the haphazard authoritarian rule of previous governments. Fascist hubris truly knows no bounds for they believe far too deeply in their own efficiency. To remedy this, a new actual grant greater fiscal autonomy to the local councils to establish new laws to running council land ownership. This law act on to helping to rebuild local democracy will incentivize new houses to be built at the breakneck pace, something desperately needed after all the destruction of the uprising. Local government shall be the foundation of the new British state, fair and prosperous to all, be they rich, poor, or young or old. Smile for the camera. Well, we're trying, so we're truly trying our best, said the Norwich Council ap apologetically, sitting down and gesturing at the crowd of curious refugees attracted by the sets of reporters and soldiers. There just aren't enough homes to go around, sir. We don't have anywhere else to put them. Something that will almost change, Butler replied firmly, making sure to address the full crowd instead of just the councillor to his right. You have my word, sir, that my government shall work day and night until each and every person displaced by these terrorists has been housed and provided for. The announcement was followed by a flurry of flashes and clicks from the eager cameraman. Mr. Butler, Mr. Butler cried out a small girl of no more than five, clearly straining to squirm her way out through the crowd. Several of the soldiers exchanged looks and one moved to intercept the boy, but was dis... Uh, girl? Intercept the boy. But was dissuaded by a shaking head from the Prime Minister. The girl, okay now, was pursued by her mother, made a vain attempt at grabbing her, but she managed to squirm from her mother's grip. Mr. Butler, Mr. Thomas says you're important you can help Mummy. <clears throat> Quietly, she hissed the girl's mother, before fearfully gazing up at him. Sorry for her, Prime Minister, it won't happen again. She gave her daughter's arm another tuck to no effect. Lucy, for a part, only pouted back at her. Uh, but they hurt you. Uh, he wants to help you, why won't you let him, Mummy? Uh, her mother flinched at her daughter's words of calling. It's quite all right, madam, he said, noting, uh, nodding at the still weary woman. Yeah. Young Miss <clears throat> Lucy's very right. We are here to help. We will do all we can to help those who harmed you to our breaths of justice. The woman murmured an emotional slang while Lucy being by her side, hugging at his sleeve, still talking. It was the ones with the funny black shirts, sir, with the mean faces. Yes, the press is a grimace of that. Darn you to Hack Fontaine, you and that band of rabid animals. A turn of the woman again. All who harmed you, madam. My governor holds no tolerance for such atrocities, nor shall it ever. The camera flashed again, and her daughter smiled, but the woman only stared, nodding blankly. A king's suggestion. Walking to Buckingham Palace, Butler had grown oddly fond of the meeting with Edward. The man himself was rather unpleasant, who disguised his selfish reasons for collaboration with the allure of some public duty to end the bloodshed. Yet, the man was charming enough, and talking with him didn't feel like a constant battle for political dominance, as it was often in the current government. After exchanging pleasantries, he sat down with Edward, who eagerly started up the conversation on recent revelations. Well, I just couldn't believe it at first. Wallace had calmed me down after I finally accepted it. He'd been my friend for decades, a companion in those dark days, for him to, be do sing, do, for him to do such a thing. Of course, that must be why I was forced to live in such relatively austere living conditions in the past few years. I'm sure he lived fine enough, Butler thought to himself, taking a sip of tea, a party a week, 
Uh, whilst Britannia starved, Edward continued to ignore ignorant to brother's introspection. Now, with that frightful matter dealt with, we must turn to who shall succeed him. I had a long list of suggestions, but Wallace and I thought here was only one man really suitable for the role. Robert Rowe, a good man and respected by the party. Butler woke from his introspection, turning to Edward with alarm. Robert Rowe, known friend of Wallace Circle Zelts, he would be worse than the mere obstruction of the Duke of Buclet. No, it cannot be him. Butler calmed himself before responding. Wallace Rowe would be a fine choice. I was considered Lord Hales for the position. Patrick is a good man and is liked more by those currently in the government. He'd be the best fit for the position at this time with the political divide so high. Edward thought for a second before agreeing to Butler's suggestion. After some minor discussions on economic reforms, the meeting was adjourned and Butler set off his mind returning to the one thought. Let's hope that Edward doesn't make any more suggestions. It's little things that matter, of course. Something about this meeting felt terribly indulgent to Butler. They were Westminster responsible for the responsible government of the whole country. They had millions of souls in the high-level organization of British society to consider, and here they were bickering about the council rates. Actually, it was hardly bickering at all. Butler had a smile on his face, and as he and Lord Chancellor Gerard Gardner politely disagreed on what best on what day was best for rubbish collection, whether it should be the day before or after the w weekly milk delivery. Discuss how council rates should increase at what rate and how much per each tax van. They weighed up how much they should invest in local libraries and whether it might be worth starting up a fleet of vans for mobile service. They involved themselves at every level of government for a meeting that ran well beyond what hour from which it was assigned. <coughs> it, uh, it felt also coined. Dealing with local matters when national ones hung over their heads like an anvil, only when they discussed the possibility of local elections could they feel the rope which suspended the anvil. That anvil slipped for a brief moment. Well, it's been, rather, oh, been a while since they had a proper election, hasn't it? Garden did not specify how long it had been. Even now, a wrong day might be... Uh, read his treason. Nevertheless, the two acknowledged him with a nod of the head. Perhaps we could organize him in a few months' time, once we've settled it and they become more used to uh, sensible rulers. I'll leave it with you, gentlemen, said Butler, rising from his seat. Apologies, I have a meeting with Maudling and Maples, looking at the clock ten m uh, minutes ago. Good day. He collected his papers and all, but sprinted out of the room, feeling all the pressures mounting again, mounting that I did not have five more minutes to discuss hedgerow notices. Future meetings, local and national, would not be so enjoyable. Of course not. Why would it be? And time for to toast and tea. Not so long ago, the hopes of restoring Britain to the glorious nation she once was would have been seen a distant dream, yet even beset from within by fascist snakes and without by madmen and traitors, we've triumphed. Uh, bringing life to a town that still doesn't seem hopeless. Today, possibilities that once seemed a mere fantasy now seem almost inevitable. That's not to say all is well, of course. The Prime Minister is not blind to the growing divisions between his lieutenants. We now bicker on Britain, on how Britain should be made a country fit for heroes, yet wherever that path may lead. Britain has taken her first steps to a brighter tomorrow, and after so much work, now is the time for us to rest. To invigorate ourselves and stretch our legs. Now then, would you care for some tea? I'm already drinking. I'm already part of the group here. Man, our growth rate is not doing great. Ah, Solus. The Prime Minister was not the sort of man who frequently found himself at a loss for words. Years upon years of creating, uh, crate orating, desperate appeals uh, to sanity in the comments had done so. Even so, Butler found himself unable to find the right words for the strange but almost pleasant sensation that had followed him today from bed to his breakfast of Downing Street with Maud. The other man seemed to sense something amiss, given him a worried look. Something the matter, Prime Minister, it's, if it's well-suited and modeling, I understand it's concerning, especially so close to the proposal. Butler waved a hand dismissively in response, taking a bite of toast as he did. Just lost the thought, Angus. Mr. Wilson and Mr. Modeling's vocal disagreements do concern me, but so long as they keep it within cabinet meetings, open discourse ought to be welcome. Not shown, particularly on a subject as sensitive as devaluing the pound. I would agree, sir, replied the Chancellor, but they aren't. It's beginning to trickle down to the rest of the party, both in the Commons and further. The share of the party without a strong opinion in favor of one man is dwindling by the day. This division will only get worse. The problem, Butler considered, was that both men were clever. Clever enough that if he raised a matter with them directly, they would swear eternal friendship and turn their eyes on one another the moment his back was turned. Let's require a settler touch. Focus on the proposal for now, but keep an ear to the ground to see if either of them has been reaching out to the ventures. Privately, he doubted. Either man would be so blatant, but it couldn't hurt. Enough of them for now. We'll have to come back to the matter soon enough. More tea? Several hours later, long after Maud had left, it finally struck him with a jolt that had the feeling been about. Wilson and Maudling, after all. Both men clearly had designs in the future direction of the BPP, and a different man might have been nervous that his lieutenants clearly wished to succeed him. As for Rob Butler, he realized he could finally name that strange feeling he'd carried with him all day. Really, that one day soon he could rest at last. On behalf of the FL team, we thank you for playing. Fantastic. With so much to do, so little time, Britain, lying in a gasping and atrophied form, has paid the ultimate price of keeping the devil you know too close to itself. But amidst this forlorn epilogue to the history of free England, there still lies a chance for hope, but it could be said for certain. Red Butler, if that name means anything to anyone outside of Whitehall at this point, shall inherit the position ordained to him for a decade, and turn all the strength, vigor, and skills left within him to envision into a new Britain. From day one, every facet of his inner circle has been fixed 
towards the Gauls' socio-economic revolution at the hands of a benevolent state. As adversaries left over from the old system, so it must be combated. It is 1965, and Rob Butler is ascended to the greatest public office in the land. Bertinot looks to the past, to the days when democracy ruled these feral isles, yet Butler's old, a veteran of four years, and his successor. One certain else stands unclear. Britain stands at a crossroads, and only time will tell where it leads. Fantastic, and if any of the devs are watching, thank you so much for making this path. I will plan on doing the other paths that, at the time's recording, are available, um, like Fountain, and maybe if there are more, uh, I will play them as well. God, that is not good for them. Um, but I also the time's video up. Kingdom of Rumania. Rumania. Very nice. Um, Transnistria, Transnistria government. Very cool, too. This is, this is definitely new, too. I like this. Ethnic turbulence. I love it. And then we also have Ukraine. Because Ukraine has a unique focus tree as well. And we'll be play, playing a lot of the Ukraine in due time. But if you enjoyed the campaign, please consider leaving a, a like. It helps me out. Subscribe if you're new. It helps me out, too. So uh, check out my Discord link if you, have, if you haven't already. And I'll see you tomorrow in another campaign. Thanks for watching. Have a tremendous rest of... Your day.